Hello there, my fellow brothers of the first, and welcome back to some 40k lore. After making introductions and covering the early histories of all the 18 legions over the last 9 months or so, we now finally come full circle. This is the point where we're gonna delve right back in the legion lore, but with a focus on something very different. This might actually vary from legion to legion, depending on how much lore there is on certain aspects, like structure or specialist for example. But for today, I thought we could cover the structure of the first legion, the Dark Angels. Because they were, in many ways, a template for all the others. I am your host, the Grim Dark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The organization and structure of the Dark Angels Legion predated the standard patterns of military organization laid out in the Principia Bellicosa. Indeed, many of the doctrines and formations in common use throughout the Astartes Legions would find their origin in the early practices of the First Legion. In fact, this would seem to be one of the main missions gifted to the Legion by the Emperor. To discover, refine and perfect the strategies and patterns that would allow his gene-crafted warriors to perform at peak efficiency. When the Imperial scholars talk about the standard form of a Space Marine Legion, they actually talk about the Dark Angels, for it was in the sacrifice of the first that these structures were born. While Gilliman would later add to and adapt this structure, even he would only build upon the foundation that was defined by the wars of the first legion before the return of Lionel Johnson. Even the lion, upon assuming command of the legion, would bow before the wisdom of the founders of the first, content to bind this original structure to a single vision and authority, and it would stay mostly unchanged until the second founding. In the earliest years of its existence, the first legion would experiment in all kinds of war, every kind of organization and formation, with a host of warriors dedicated to almost any tactical or strategic ploy. This meant that the legion contained specialists suited to every opponent and battlefield, but unfortunately it lacked a cohesive structure to organize all these warriors. It was by its very nature fluid and chaotic, ever-changing as certain tactics fell out of favor and new ones rose to prominence. Ironically, the chaos was a required tool for its purpose, and in time it would turn into order, a system of supporting and overlapping formations which existed in parallel and allowed the Legion to confront any enemy on any battlefield and still win. The system of specialized formations stood at the heart of the First Legion, and it was around this core that they were built. Their hierarchical unit structure was composed of a descending hierarchy of chapters, companies and squads. This was the shape of its overt hierarchy anyway, the uncloaked face it showed to its brother legions and to the Imperium at large. But each of the warriors of the legion also had a position in a second, covert layer of operation, one that they kept hidden from those not of the legion. This strata of organization was composed primarily of two distinct bodies, the Great Hosts and the Orders of Battle, or Hecatonistica. Both the elements would serve to allow the collection and codification of martial knowledge by the warriors of the Legion and to see that this knowledge was available on the battlefield when and where it was most needed. The Great Hosts were the bigger of the two organizations, numbering at first in the dozens with each individual force claiming the loyalty of hundreds of individual warriors. The hosts were dedicated to the perfection of one art of war and one alone, as some specialized in siege warfare, others in the arts of skirmish, and yet more in the brutal discipline of shock assault, and many other tactics beside. The hosts did not fight as a cohesive formation in most situations, being spread across the various chapters and companies of the Legion. Any given unit might comprise members of a variety of different hosts all working together, lending their experience and skills to their battle brothers so that the whole had a value far greater than the individual. No matter the challenge faced by even the least unit of the first legion, they would always find at least one expert in the ranks, an advantage compared to the younger legions, each of which was dedicated to a single brand of conquest and relatively ill-equipped to fight outside their preferred sphere. 
only in the most dire of situations would the host assemble en masse. Its acolytes called out from the ranks to form a single body of those most dedicated in the chosen art. Be it the siege rites of the host of stone, or the breaching clades of the host of the void, such a body was a potent force in its chosen element, more than capable of turning the tide of even the direst battle. Each host had the same organizational structure, each with its own master, marshals, and initiates, organized into cells scattered across the chapters of the Legion. These cells were embedded at the heart of the Legion core, operating alongside the companies and the squads of its open and public hierarchy. Any given squad might include members from several cells, each one bound in service to a different host. They were at once brothers, sealed by the oaths made to Legion and Sergeant, and made strangers by the secret eyes and mysteries of their host. A warrior owed his obedience to both the commander in the ranks of the Legion public hierarchy and the superior in the hidden society of the host with only the subtle context of tradition to tell when one held authority over the other. It is a testament to the fortitude of the minds and the enduring loyalty of these warriors, that such a complex and convoluted system not only functioned, but excelled in bringing victory to the Legion. The great hosts of the first recruited openly and widely among the uninitiated warriors of the Legion. When new intakes of recruits reached frontline companies, they would find themselves under constant scrutiny from the appointed procurators of the hosts, each seeking signs of the aspirant's worthiness to join their host. Those selected to be the procurators, having already faced the trials upon the battlefield and in the subtle tests conducted by their brothers and commanders, would be quickly inducted into the most basic tenets of the host, and granted a right to bear its mark upon their power armor. The warriors initiated into a host met freely within the precincts of the Legion holdings and incumbents and debated strategy and the proper use of arms, with those of the higher rank responsible for the training of those below them. The gatherings, although not secret, were considered a private matter of the host, a forum where a warrior's standing in the host was greater than that of his formal rank in the Legion. Members could speak about the business of the host the practice and protection of their unique rights of battle and traditions, without any fear of censure, for it was considered the duty of the hosts to preserve the Legion via their unstinting pursuit of excellence. Moving on, the orders of battle, also known as the Hecatonistica, were more numerous, but boasted far fewer adherents than the hosts. Of the hundreds of individual orders, most could count no more than a dozen initiates, a mere handful of warriors by comparison to the vast hosts and chapters of the Greater Legion. Such warrior fraternities could not disseminate their knowledge across the entire Legion in the same manner as the hosts, and harbored skill sets which were ill disposed towards such a use. The orders of battle were experts in a single bloody aspect of war, the destruction of a singular foe or the mastery of some aberrant field of conflict. When a battle group of the First Legion encountered a foe worthy of their hatred, or a field of battle whose nature defied their contempt, it was to the orders of battle that they turned, forming a Cenobium, a cadre of warriors from an order trained to negate the enemy, to lead the assault, and to turn all their secret knowledge into a weapon to smite the enemies of humanity. Each order of battle maintained a strict hierarchy, although no two were exactly the same with each organized to best serve the aims and lore kept by that order. Because, unlike the hosts, which openly recruited and shared much of their knowledge when called to battle, the orders were much more secretive. The true position and nature of the ranks within a given order were only understood by the initiates of that order, with a system of ciphers and cryptic signs unique to each order used to mark them out to those who had been inducted into their ranks. Each tier of the order granted an initiate greater understanding of the mysteries it had been created to preserve, and placed upon them a great burden of responsibility in keeping that knowledge ready to be called upon at need. The order would meet to affirm their knowledge in the form of rituals and tradition, as well as to train in more traditional ways. Most orders maintained a sanctum chamber aboard any vessel to which they were posted, a private space into which entry was only granted to ordained members of the order, 
and where ritual training and study could be pursued in peace. Some of the biggest orders controlled entire space stations, most often based in and around war zones that supported or required their skills. For example, the Order of Broken Spears operated an orbital stronghold capable of hosting all its 138 known members. Set in place above the broken mesas and twisting canyons of Argyll III, a death world whose rock was laced with traces of heavy metal that countered most active sensor systems. Given that the Broken Spears were masters in the art of ambush, and the silent war of wits that prevailed in such environments, this served as the perfect location for the training of its warriors and as a retreat for those veterans wanting to contemplate the teachings of the Order without distraction. These sanctums, whether grand strongholds or spartan chambers aboard a vessel, were also serving a crucial role in the recruitment of new members. Such prospective acolytes were identified by the senior members of a cell by the record of their achievements and skill, and were subjects to much debate within the cell before any decision was made. Once summoned by a cell, a warrior could expect to face a set of grueling physical and mental trials, administered in the seclusion of the Order's domain where the candidates were granted limited rights of entry, though often under binding oaths to hold secret all that they witnessed. The trials could vary widely between Orders, though often presented the very real possibility of serious injury and even death for those accepting the challenge. The exact nature of the rituals was kept secret, and even those that failed were bound by the honor of the Legion not to speak of that which they faced. Such was the respect given to the orders of the Hecatonistica by the rank and file of the Legion. Once fully inducted, they would receive the freedom of the order's domain, and the right to begin study of the first tier of the hidden lore in their new warrior brotherhood, and to bear the mark of its acolyte upon the ceramite of their warplate. To hold a position even in the outer circles of one of the orders militant of the Hecatonistica was considered a great honor, and of the entire legion, less than half could claim such an achievement. Though few outside of the ranks of a given order knew the full import of the insignia borne by its adepts, all of the legion's warriors granted the bearer of such a sigil due respect, and few among even the most senior of the commanders would fail to heed their advice no matter what formal rank they might hold outside the order. Though it was a rare occurrence, some particularly skilled warriors in the Legion bore the insignia of more than one of the order's militant upon the armor. In some cases, such warriors had formally departed one order to take up position in a new one, sworn to keep the secrets of their old association, while in the most exceptional of cases, they might hold rank in two or more orders at the same time. There's only a few examples of this the most well-known being of course the Primarch himself, who held the rank of High Preceptor of every order in the Legion, and also Knight Captain Atreus Decalion, bearer of the sword Chryseor. Ultimately, it was this arcane, covert and deeply layered organization of the First which provided the best defense against the corruption of Chaos and the traitors in the years before the outbreak of the Horus Heresy. Horus and Lorgar's warrior lodges could not infiltrate the ranks of the Dark Angels, as they were shunned by the preceptors of the Order's militant as worthless and beneath them. I can imagine those chaplains returning to Erebus and going, Boss, we can't infiltrate them. They got something better already. It is we who should be emulating them. Thus, the Dark Angels would never suffer corruption due to the actions of Horus and his allies among the traitors. Yet, even as the heresy ended, they would face their own betrayal from within, driven by the same flaws of jealousy and vainglory which drove the War Master to rebel against the Emperor. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the Dark Angel's unique Legion structure for today. For those of you who are fans of the First Legion, I also got some really good news. Since the lore on their organization is so rich, there's gonna be a ton of videos in the future focusing on just that. As even just the wings of the Hexagrammaton, for example, like the Dreadwing, the Deathwing, the Firewing, etc., are, by themselves, lore rich enough to warrant at least one video. Of course, I'm not gonna be making just Dark Angels videos for the next year, however. 
but I thought you should know that there are more videos coming on them in the future. As always, I do look forward to reading your thoughts on their unique system in the comments below. If you enjoyed this, do consider leaving a like, share, and subscribe for future content too. Thanks a lot, and the Emperor protects.